Welcome to Seminars at Steamboat. I'm Joella West, Seminars Chair. Today we move on to a subject that has been on our list of important policy concerns for several years. And we know that while it may not be in the top five elsewhere, it is near and dear to our hearts in Steamboat. And somehow with every passing year, it has become not just more important, but urgent for a variety of reasons. So we're excited to bring you a presentation by an expert in this area, followed by an expanded opportunity for audience questions. We encourage you to participate in the Q&A. Just click on the chat, which appears at the bottom of your screen. You can do that at any time during the talk. If you find today's talk interesting and would like to share it with others, please direct them to our website where this talk will be captioned and posted later this week. You'll also find recordings of all four of our prior events from this season, as well as information about the upcoming August 16th and 23rd speakers and topics. And you can also view events from years past. Of course, we always appreciate a contribution, which you can make now or at any time by clicking on the donate button at the top of the page. Our nonpartisan public policy discussions are always free to the public, and we depend on your generosity to continue to make that possible. In addition to our website, we're also on Facebook and Instagram, and KUNC Community Radio of Northern Colorado makes this year's talks available on their website at KUNC.org's seminars podcast landing page. Special thanks to today's sponsors, Susan and Alan Kirkpatrick, and Judy Odom and Ron Vermillion. Our speaker today is John Leshy, and here to introduce him is board member Walt Dabbert. Thank you, Joella. Thank you, Joella, and good evening. I'm Walt Dabbert, and it is my great pleasure to introduce this evening's uh, distinguished speaker, Professor John Leshy who will share with us an, ins an insightful history and a compelling outlook for our public lands. John has worn many different hats throughout his lengthy and distinguished career. Jurist, lawyer, academician, government official, historian, environmentalist, and avid outdoorsman. Allow me to share with you a few of the very many highlights of his remarkable career. John Leshy began litigating in the 1970s in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. More recently, Professor Leshy has been at the UC Hastings College of the Law for the past 20 years, and that followed a tenure of eight years at the U.S. Department of the Interior, where he was general counsel or solicitor. Before that, he again was in Interior uh, under the Carter administration. And he was special counsel to the chair of the Committee on Natural Resources in the U.S. House of Representatives. As testament to his dedication to the environment, John Leshy received the 2013 Le uh, Legacy Award uh, from the Defenders of Wildlife for his lifetime contribution to wildlife conservation. John Leshy is also a prolific author on a variety of subjects, including the Mining Law of 1872, the Arizona Constitution, and various textbooks on water law and federal land and natural resources law. This coming January, Yale University Press will publish his much anticipated book titled, Our Common Ground, A History of America's Public Lands. Following his presentation, I will rejoin you uh, and John for the Q&A, which I will help moderate. You may say, uh, submit, as Joella has told you, questions at any time throughout the presentation by using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And now please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to John Leshy. Thank you very much, Walt. I'm very pleased to uh, participate in the Steamboat Lecture Series, and I thank you very much for inviting me 
Uh, I only wish I could uh, see you and your lovely surroundings uh, in person. Uh, the surroundings, of course, include a lot of public lands, and that's the, my topic for today. Um, what I want to do today with uh, the new administration getting settled in the nation's capital uh, is to take a quick look back at the uh, long history of America's public lands and to reflect on what might lie ahead. Um, and by public lands, um, whoops, just a second here. By public lands, I mean the, those managed by the four major federal land agencies, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, and the National Park Service depicted on this map. Uh, my forthcoming book that Walt mentioned uh, really tries to answer this question. How did it come to pass that in a nation that celebrates private property and individual freedom and capitalism and distrusts government, particularly the national government, how did it come to pass that the, the national government owns nearly one third of the real estate in the nation and manages it largely for inspiration, uh, recreation and biodiversity protection as depicted on this map? Now, public lands are sometimes sort of scorned as uh, political lands. The label is actually accurate because the political process has always controlled the fate of these lands. My book recounts the key political decisions that explain what you see on this map. Now, those key political decisions had three notable characteristics. Interestingly, each one of them is somewhat at odds with what many people believe, especially here in the West. The first is this, the government's decision to hold on to and protect these lands almost always had, whoops, where'd I go? Almost always had the strong support from the people in the most directly affected areas. Now, this is somewhat at odds with the conventional view that today's public lands are mostly the result of a land grab by the national government, a land grab that was strongly resisted by the states and local communities where these lands were found. That myth continues to resonate, particularly with fringe elements like those leading an armed takeover of the National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon in 2016. The second characteristic of these decisions is that they almost never involved sharp divisions along political party lines. To the contrary, they have usually been the result of and have helped cement a political consensus to bring us together, not drive us apart as Euro-American settlement extended across the continent and new states were admitted to the Union. The tragic fate of indigenous peoples was of course a very large exception to those ideas. The usual sequence of events went something like this. Native Americans were dispossessed through duress, chicanery, sometimes force by an evolving cast of characters, speculators, squatters, miners, and other developers, often backed by the US military. Then the native nations yielded title to the United States government through arrangements that, while providing them some compensation, would never fully make up for the injustices that were perpetuated or the enormity of their loss. Almost without exception, it was only after the US acquired title, often many years after, that the government decided to hold on to and protect these lands in national ownership. Now, the third noteworthy characteristic about these decisions is that since the turn of the 20th century, they have almost always been to hold more and more lands in national ownership in order to safeguard their resources for science, education, and wide public use and enjoyment. Now, here's a slide that captures this in a nutshell in 10-year increments. The left-hand vertical axis is, is millions of acres. Um, <clears throat> and they, these are in 10-year increments. Now, let me explain. Reserve public lands, the, the solid line, means decisions to keep these lands in national ownership by withholding them from divestiture laws like the railroad land grants or the Homestead Acts. And then mostly protected, the dotted line, means generally, not necessarily completely, but generally protected from industrial and other intensive developments like mining, large-scale logging, dam building, road building, and the like. That's the dotted line. Now, public lands history, to be sure, is not without blemishes. Many of the decision makers who charted this path beginning in the late 19th century, 
as shown here, uh, held racist and sexist beliefs. Native Americans, women, people of color were largely excluded from the political uh, system and were not prominent players in this story, particularly in the early days. Also, federal agencies tasked by Congress to manage these lands sometimes behaved less than honorably in dealing with the Indians who sought to use them for traditional purposes. There's a growing literature on this subject that addresses that in considerable detail. Now, Congress took small steps in this direction in 1864 and 1872, you can barely see it, the solid line on the bottom there, uh, by preserving iconic American landscapes at Yosemite in 1864 and Yellowstone in 1872. But the big turning point came, as you can see, in 1890. Uh, in the two decades starting in 1890, uh, that year Congress established several national parks, and then in 1891 gave the president broad power to set apart and reserve some of the public lands as public reservations, which put them off limits to the divestiture law. Now, one motivation for that decision to create what came to be known as forest reserves, later the National Forest, was to safeguard the water resources in the upper re reaches of the Western watersheds. Not well appreciated is fact by 1890, the West was already the most urban region in the country. Denver's population, for example, had grown from 5,000 in 1860 to 100,000, more than 100,000 in 1890. It was already clear that the traditional policy of settling by granting public lands to promote small family farms, the homestead idea, was not gonna work in the more rugged and arid parts of the West. There was also a strong sense that the national government needed to rein in the appetite of large industrial enterprises like railroads for taking control of vast amounts of land for private property, for, for uh, <clears throat> private profit and push common folk aside. An influential evangelist for that point of view uh, was a political economist named Henry George, the guy on the left who had spent years in the West and whose masterpiece, Progress and Poverty, outsold every book in this era except the Bible. His warning that public lands not suitable for farming was likely to fall into a few hands reverberated with a populace increasingly dissatisfied with garish corruption and vast income and wealth inequalities that mark what Mark Twain here in the center called the Gilded Age in his book of that name. <clears throat> Now, by 1891, all the Western states except Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico had been admitted to the Union and had voting representation in Congress. No Western member of Congress voiced an objection to giving the president authority, broad authority to reserve public lands. Now, what happened after Congress passed that law uh, shows how deeply that legislation reflected mainstream opinion in the West. Within a month, Benjamin Harrison, president on the right, used it to return, uh, reserve 1 million acres in the state of Wyoming. And the very next day appointed that gentleman on the left, Thomas Carter, who was a Montana Congressman uh, to head the general land office in the interior department. That's the government agency that was then in charge of all public lands. Carter was politically ambitious. He would later represent Montana in the Senate in two terms. And he was the first Westerner to head the GLO. He promptly directed his staff to launch a systematic inventory looking to quote, Preserve all public lands in mountainous and other regions that produce water flows for the use of communities and settlements downstream. Yeah, he said, reserve all such public lands. The idea was met with enthusiasm in the region as well as elsewhere. In 1892, for example, Colorado state officials, Chambers of Commerce of Denver and Colorado Springs, the State Forestry Association, and 500 leading citizens petitioned the president to reserve all public lands in a 12 mile belt along the crests of all the mountain ranges and spurs in the state. Before leaving office in 1893, Harrison had established more than 13 million acres of forest reserves, including 3 million acres in Colorado. Poet Catherine Lee Bates would visit the reserve created around Park Pikes Peak soon after that. And she credited that visit with inspiring her to write the stirring words to America the Beautiful, celebrating its purple mountain majesties. Over the next 16 years, Harrison's three successors depicted here set aside most of what is now the national forest system, well over 150 million acres. With a couple of minor exceptions, Congress never interfered. Theodore Roosevelt on the right batted cleanup in this lineup, 
It's notable that while he was busily putting more and more Western public lands into these reserves, he ran for a full term in November 1904 and won the national popular vote by the biggest margin since 1820 and carried every single Western state, almost all of them by a substantially bigger margin than he ran nationally. Now back to this slide. You can see this is here, the steep curve going up between 1900 and 1910. That's Theodore Roosevelt's uh, legacy here. Um, in his remaining time in office, he put more than uh, tens of millions more acres in the forest reserves, including 7 million acres in Colorado, including the forest, national forest near Steamboat. A couple of years after Roosevelt left office, Congress, with broad bipartisan support, made the national forest system truly national. The Weeks Act of 1911 launched a program that eventually resulted in the establishment of 52 national forests in more than two dozen states in the East, Southwest, and Midwest. You can see it in the green on the map here, the lighter green, Eastern and Midwestern national forests. Much of this land in the East and Midwest had been previously logged over. And so the Weeks Act was actually the nation's first significant environmental restoration law. The story that led to our national forests was replayed numerous times thereafter. Sometimes Congress did the work itself, enacting law after law, establishing national parks like in Colorado, Mesa Verde and Rocky Mountain, and other protected areas. Now here's a key point. Congress never took such a step without strong local support. That was because members of Congress representing a particular area had, and still have today, what amounts to a de facto veto over legislation that primarily affects their constituents. Now, the reason why Congress gives local representatives this veto is straightforward. It's because few members from elsewhere are willing to override the objections of representatives from the affected area for fear that next time the tables could be turned on them. Now, sometimes the Congress gave the president broad power to act like it had done in the 1891 Forest Reserve Act. A prime example was the Antiquities Act of 1906, which vested the president with broad power to designate national monuments on public lands. Presidents Harding and Hoover, for example, used the Antiquities Act to establish and protect Hoven Weep and Great Sand Dunes and Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Monuments in Colorado. Now, where the president took the lead, it too was mindful that for its actions to be durable, it needed to gain the support of the people who, as Theodore Roosevelt once put it, live in the neighborhood. Now, this story was repeated many times across the nation in succeeding decades. The U.S. acquired and protected these national forests in the East, South, and Midwest because state and local leaders ask it to do so. Iconic national parks like the Great Smoky Mountains, and that's the darker uh, green here, and Everglades in the tip of Florida, and Big Bend over here in Texas, um, they came into being because states and private citizens funded the acquisition of the necessary lands that were then in private ownership and then donated those lands to the national government. The first several decades of the 20th century also saw the beginnings of what became eventually a large system of national wildlife refuges. And these are sprinkled largely along the coast and in the upper Midwest. Uh, and, uh, and also large areas in Alaska. Uh, as these wildlife refuges were established through a combination of congressional legislation and executive action. Sometimes they were reservation of lands the U.S. already owned, and sometimes they were lands the U.S. acquired by purchase. Colorado, by the way, has eight national wildlife refuges. All of this done in a bipartisan fashion with little controversy. Now, as the Great Depression and so-called Dust Bowl conditions hit Western farming and ranching particularly hard in the 1930s, Congress accelerated the trend. It authorized the federal government to acquire, or to reacquire millions of acres of failed homesteads that had passed out of federal ownership under the homestead laws and then failed. Uh, some of these became national grasslands. Colorado has two national grasslands in the Eastern part of the state. More important here in the 1930s for the first time Congress began regulating livestock grazing on the remaining public lands. These are the lands in orange on this map. And this paved the way for them to be rehabilitated and kept permanently in national ownership. The legislation that did this was crafted by two key players in Congress. Uh, on the right is 
Edward Taylor, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, a Democrat, he was on a proposal that Don Colton, the Republican from Utah, had strongly pushed in the preceding Congress. Enacted with strong bipartisan support, the Taylor Grazing Act of 1934 assigned this task to the Interior Department. <clears throat> and eventually in 1946, the Bureau of Land Management was established to manage these lands. So here we are in the 30s going steeply up. This is the sort of Taylor Grazing Act uh, legacy. <clears throat> the 1960s saw a further acceleration. It grew out of a campaign by a conservative Democrat from Grand Junction, Wayne Aspinall on the left. Aspinall wanted Congress to claw back a good deal of the power it had given to the executive branch to decide what kinds of uses should be allowed on particular tracts of public land. Aspinall's biggest success came in the Wilderness Act of 1964. This is an act that had strong support across both parties. Conservative Republican John Saylor on the right was one of its chief architects. The Wilderness Act created a new category of federal lands uh, that Congress said were generally to remain free from roads, motorized vehicles, and extractive activities like logging and mining. Furthermore, at Aspinall's insistence, Congress made itself the gatekeeper of the wilderness system. And so to this day, an act of Congress is required to put an acre in the wilderness system, which means as I explained, it needs to have the support of the congressional delegation from that area. Congre uh, Colorado, by the way, has 42 wilderness areas. One of the original ones is near Steamboat Springs. Now Congress did something very similar to Wilderness Act in the six, four years later in the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act of 1968. And beginning around the same time, Congress enacted numerous other statutes that using different labels, each made conservation and recreation primary management objectives of large tracts of public land. Each had the support of local members of Congress. Congress established the first national recreation area in 1964. There are now more than three dozen covering many millions of acres, including two in Colorado. Congress established the first national conservation area in 1970. There are now 17, including three in Colorado. Congress established the first two national preserves in 1974. There are now nearly two dozen. Beginning in the 60s, Congress established nearly a dozen national seashores and lakeshores. And this is the rising line going up in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, <clears throat> In doing all this, interestingly enough, Congress increasingly blurred the distinctions among the four principal land management agencies. BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, Park Service, and the Forest Service, uh, each has, uh, uh, because Congress has given each one of those agencies many millions of acres to manage with similar labels like wilderness, wild and scenic rivers, recreation areas, conservation areas, and the like. This is elevated in the public's mind that Regardless of which agency has managed them, public lands are generally managed more for open space conservation and recreation than anything else. Now here's the most prominent example of what I'm talking about. In 1976, Congress gave the BLM, which was often referred to as the Bureau of Livestock and Mining, a new management charter. The primary thrust of that law, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, or FLIPMA as it's called, was a call for greener management. It was crafted by a congressional conference committee dominated by Westerners, and it put in place nearly all the recommendations of a blue ribbon commission that Wayne Aspinall had chaired and was also dominated by Westerners. FLIPMA cemented into law a transformation that was already well underway as reflected in the redoing of BLM's emblem back in the 60s. Uh, the old emblem of the BLM on the left, there's the miner, logger, rancher, engineer, surveyor, looking over an industrial landscape, the BLM logo on the right is, of course, mountains, a river, and a tree. Uh, common modern quip is that the BLM now means Bureau of Landscape and Monuments. Through all this, the bipartisan tradition continued. Although the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress in the 1960s and 1970s, congressional Republicans like John Saylor, I've already mentioned, uh, played key roles in crafting those laws, and Republican presidents Nixon and Ford were generally as supportive as their Democratic candidate, uh, counterparts. Now, in 1980, Congress enacted the 
Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, or ANILCA, with strong bipartisan support. It reflected Alaska's enormous size, 365 million acres, over which were then scattered about 400,000 people. The, the scale of that law was stunning. And this is the steep rise between 1970 and 1980, largely reflects ANILCA. ANILCA put nearly 100 million acres of public lands into the National Wildlife Refuge and Park Systems, tripling the size of the former and doubling the size of the latter. And a good many of those lands were also put in the wilderness system, which tripled its size. And if you look at the map and see the inset of Alaska, you can see how ANILCA uh, basically distributed those lands among the agencies. Uh, ANILCA, by the way, is the exception that proves the rule. It's the only significant piece of legislation in US history dealing with public lands in a single state that became the law over the objection of the opposition of the state's congressional delegation. Alaska's three members of Congress did exercise a great deal of influence over its terms, but as the title indicated, Congress in the end asserted the national interest in these Alaska public lands after a powerful grassroots campaign conducted throughout the lower 48 states. Now these trends have continued right up to the present with a few minor hiccups along the way. Ronald Reagan actually proposed to sell off 35 million acres of so-called surplus public lands to reduce the federal budget deficit. The idea went absolutely nowhere. Reagan's first interior secretary, James Watt, proposed to issue oil and gas leases in wilderness areas for the first time and he was stopped by Congress with Western Republicans playing prominent roles. Reagan learned his lesson. In 1984, with the Senate and Republican control, he signed bills into law that added more than 8 million acres to the national wilderness system, the most protective category. And you can see this here. Uh, the steep rise is ANOCA, but then look what happened during Reagan's term of office. The slope continued upward sharply. Before he left office, Actually, Ronald Reagan signed legislation putting more acreage in the wilderness system in the lower 48 than any president before him or after him. Even as partisan rhetoric intensified in the modern era, that trend has continued as shown by the rising uh, dotted line here from 1990 on. Thus, although the contract with America that Newt Gingrich used to lead Republicans to take control of the House of Representatives in 1994, bristled with anti-government rhetoric, it was completely silent on public lands. Its principal architect, Republican messaging guru Frank Luntz, bluntly advised the GOP to resist making a head-on challenge to what he called, quote, the most popular federal programs today, specifically conservation of public lands and waters through parks and open spaces, close quote. So those lines continue to go up after the turn of the 20th century. In 2009, for example, President Obama signed a major so-called omnibus public land protection bill into law. Most of its parts had been assembled earlier when the Republicans controlled the White House and, and one house of Congress. The trend line remain, remained unaltered after the so-called Tea Party insurgency led to the Republicans to recapture control of the house in 2010. And it remained largely unaltered after Donald Trump was elected president. In 2019, Trump signed another omnibus public lands protection package into law. It added more than a million acres in several states into the wilderness system and expanded several national park system units and made permanent the Land and Water Conservation Fund that Congress had established in 1964. That fund provides a stream of money derived primarily from public land mineral revenues for federal, state, and local agencies to buy more land for conservation and recreation. Then last year, in the Great American Outdoors Act that President Trump signed into law, took an even more important step. Because Congress had previously insisted that it controlled the expenditures from the fund, less than half of the more than $40 billion that fund accrued between 1965 and 2019 were actually spent. Enacted with strong bipartisan support, the Great American Outdoors Act of 2020 made it a true revolving fund, permitting its revenues to be spent as they were accrued. This was a major victory for public lands everywhere. Now, as before, all this was done on a bipartisan basis. It's not the product of a socialist plot. 
As everyone who lives in areas with abundant public lands knows, those lands provide many opportunities for private enterprise to flourish. It is instead the American political process working as it's supposed to work, where Congress responds to and reflects public opinion. Now, to be sure, as on practically every issue where a broad consensus supports governmental action, there's a small if sometimes noisy group of dissenters hostile to just about everything the government does. But for many years, opinion polls in the West, as well as the rest of the nation, have shown that by large majorities, regardless of party identification, people want more and better protected public lands to provide open space and recreational opportunities and protect watersheds and features of historic, scientific, and cultural interest. And there's lots of research showing that the greater percentage of protective public lands, the more robust the local economy and the more attractive it is to industries like tech. Now, the Trump administration did seek to undo or weaken protections for public lands almost everywhere it could. Most prominently in a move of unprecedented scale, uh, President Trump shrank by two thirds two large national monuments that Clinton and Obama had established on more than three acres, uh, three million acres of land in southern Utah um, in 1996 and 2016. One of them was Bears Ears. Here's a rally in support of uh, Obama's declaration of the Bears Ears monument. And here is Donald Trump signing the proclamation that shrank the monument. Trump's decision was to reduce, not abolish the monuments, reflecting in fact that there was considerable support in Utah for protecting public lands. In fact, in 2019, Trump signed into law that Omnibus Public Land Protection Act that included new protections for nearly a million acres of public land in Southern Utah, not very far from Bears Ears, a bill that was crafted by the local Republican Congressman, John Curtis. It surprised no one then that in his first week in office, President Biden indicated that he would restore these two national monuments uh, to their original size. Now, despite this long established trend toward holding and protecting more lands and national ownership, the future is cloudy. These lands face enormous challenges, especially the interrelated ones of climate change and biodiversity loss. Now you've all seen charts like this showing how the planet is warming at an accelerated rate. A destabilizing climate poses countless tests for public lands, as you could imagine. It, it alters the natural qualities that were a primary reason for holding and protecting these lands. New York Times headline not long ago said, your children's Yellowstone will be radically different. The glaciers in Joshua and Sequoia trees in the national parks named for them are disappearing. Florida's Everglades and numerous other protected areas along, of public lands along the coasts, including nearly one third of the nation's 550 national wildlife refuges face inundation as seas rise. In many public lands rich places, droughts are becoming more frequent, more severe and long lasting. And as you well know, large wildflowers, wildfires more intense. Adapting to changing fire, hydrologic and vegetation regimes and wildlife migration corridors can be very complicated. Public land managers have no rule book for this kind of management, so it's a big challenge. Another challenge is determining the role public lands should play in addressing the primary cause of climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, so as to avoid more catastrophic impacts. Fossil fuels, produced from public lands onshore and offshore currently account for about a quarter of total US greenhouse gas emissions. The public lands onshore, quite a bit less than that, about 8% or so. Now that makes it inevitable that climate concerns will increasingly drive US public land decision-making. But frankly, the fossil fuel industry has much bigger problems to worry about. There are powerful global forces that are accelerating. What is likely to be absent huge unexpected breakthroughs in carbon capture technology, the end of humanity's more than century old love affair with fossil fuels. We've all read about the rapid increase in renewable energy sources like solar and wind and how major automakers gathered with the president last week committing to manufacture only electric vehicles in not much more than a decade from now and how investors are focusing more intently on reducing carbon emissions 
All this can be captured in one statistic. In 1980, 12 of the top 25 Fortune 500 companies were in the petroleum business. Today, one is, and that one not likely for long. Fossil fuel enterprises currently operating on public lands will not go quietly as the noise currently being generated about Biden's pause in federal oil and gas leasing shows, but their fate is being dictated by global forces, not by the Biden administration. Ironically, the Trump administration itself provided a dramatic demonstration of this. Its campaign to lease as much public land as it could to petroleum companies was capped by a highly anticipated auction of leases in the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge on Alaska's North Slope. The 1980 ANILCA legislation had closed it to leasing, but in 2017, on a strict party line vote, Congress directed that it be leased. Proponents said this would raise a lot of revenue for the state of Alaska, whose budget is heavily dependent on oil revenues, and for the US Treasury, and would take advantage of the excess capacity in the Trans-Alaska pipeline nearby. But in the auction that was held just this past January, shortly before the Trump administration left office, none of the industry's major players participated. Half of the tracks that were offered got no bids at all. The remaining 11 attracted a total of 13 bids. Almost all of the bids were submitted by an agency of the state of Alaska at the floor price. Instead of billions of dollars, the sale yielded a paltry 14 million. This spoke much louder than the words of advocates of fossil fuel development on public lands. Just as the stone age did not end because the world ran out of stones, the petroleum age will not end because the world runs out of oil. Instead, it will end because of technological advances and market forces that both stem from a growing appreciation of the ruinous consequences of continued carbon emissions. It is, in short, difficult to see much of a future for fossil fuels on public lands, even if forthcoming elections led to a revival of the Trump administration policies. Now, public land policy can facilitate the transition away from fossil fuels by helping to mitigate its effect on displaced fossil fuel workers. Congress is not right now seriously considering proposals to clean up messes left on public lands from past mineral extraction. This work is labor intensive, and will take dozens of billions of dollars of public money uh, to do it. Public lands can also help meet the growing market for solar and wind generation and furnish sites for transmission lines needed to modernize the electrical grid. But just how big a role public lands will ultimately, ultimately play on this score is not yet clear. Solar and wind resources are found off public lands as well as on public lands, and there's a tremendous wind energy resource on public lands offshore. Moreover, practically every area of public lands is treasured by some interest group from livestock operators to wildlife advocates. Whether solar and wind generation will flourish on public lands onshore depends to some extent on how welcoming the federal regulatory regime is compared to state and local regimes. About all that can be said at this point is that just as the decline in fossil fuel extraction from public lands will have bumps along the way, so will efforts to use the public lands to facilitate the carbon-free electrification of the nation's economy. Now, growing th threats to biodiversity are a second major challenge. Uh, like the changing climate to which it is closely related, it's a global problem. The small and declining fraction of the Earth's land now free from obvious human impact is accelerating what has already been described as the sixth great extinction in the planet's history. More than 40 years ago, the eminent biologist E.O. Wilson called the loss of biodiversity from careless misuse and destruction of natural habitats the, quote, folly that our descendants are least likely to forgive. Wilson has advocated setting aside half the Earth's surface as a protected natural reserve. As an interim step, most of the world's nations have now endorsed a so-called 30 by 30 goal to protect 30% of their land and marine areas by the year 2030, uh, 2030, sorry. In one of his first acts, President Biden directed the Interior Secretary and others to develop a, an America the Beautiful plan to achieve that goal. A, a nice link to public land since America the Beautiful, of course, was the Catherine Lee Bates song. <clears throat> America's public lands give it a good start, 
as they account for most of the U.S. land and marine areas that are now considered protected. It's fitting that the public lands will play a primary role in that America the Beautiful campaign, for the U.S. has long been a world leader in safeguarding large tracts of land for conservation, beginning with the establishment of Yellowstone as the world's first national park. Now, while the fossil fuel industry faces what looks like an inevitable decline on public lands, many other longstanding uses of public lands have already declined in both the amount of public lands they occupy and in their economic importance locally and nationally. Hard rock mining, for example, was the original engine of Western, westward settlement with the gold and other mineral rushes. Indeed, the mining law of 1872 that Congress enacted to govern that uh, is amazingly still in effect. But hard rock mining now occurs on less than a half a million acres of public land, most of it at a few large mines in Nevada that produce gold to make jewelry, primarily. Some public lands are mined for relatively plentiful substances like clay and stone and uh, calcium. And there's a quant, you probably heard about the controversial quarry on public lands near Glenwood Springs, whose proposed expansion is now being challenged in court by the city and local citizens. Now, a few minerals that can be found on public land like cobalt, copper, nickel, lithium are crucial to making the transition to electrified, uh, to the electrified carbon-free economy uh, needed to avoid climate catastrophe. Whether and how public lands might contribute supplies of these minerals was addressed in a just uh, issued report by the Biden administration. Uh, here's the cover of the report. It notes that ample supplies of some of these minerals are found on non-federal lands or in friendly foreign nations, and that recycling can be a major source of some of these minerals. Different minerals call for different strategies, the report put it. It also called the Mining Law of 1872 uh, so antiquated that it's an obstacle to moving forward and called on Congress to reform it and the BLM and the Forest Service to strengthen their regulations of these mines. Then there's timber harvesting. After growing dramatically in the years after World War II, timber harvesting from public lands peaked in the mid 1980s, and then they shrank to pre-war levels by the turn of the 21st century, and they've remained there. There's water projects. The dam building era on public lands ended a half century or so ago. Today, we're much more likely to talk about removing existing dams than building new ones. Then there's grazing by domesticated livestock. It still occurs on well over half of the public land acreage in the lower 48 states, including most of the BLM lands and more than half of the lands in the national forests. But a hotter, drier climate is posing a huge challenge for this industry. The problem is not just or even primarily declining forage. A bigger problem is more intense competition for dwindling water supplies, which threatens what is by a considerable margin the largest single use of water in the Intermountain West irrigating alfalfa for livestock to be. There's been a spate of stories recently about how livestock operators are reducing herds with some turning to other pursuits altogether. When Congress was deliberating over the Taylor Grazing Act in the 1930s, the skies over Washington were darkened by the dust blowing from the worn out farms of the Dust Bowl. Leading Oklahoma Senator Thomas Gore to call that the most tragic and impressive lobbyist ever to come to the Capitol which demands action now, he said, because it gives proof positive there is no economy <clears throat> in play. Today's drought is much more prolonged than that produced that produced the Dust Bowl. Indeed, tree ring analysis suggests that the West is in the longest drought it's seen in more than a thousand years, causing some scientists to describe what's underway, not a drought, but a redification, a much longer term change. I was reminded of Senator Gore's description as the skies over the Capitol were darkened this year with Western fires. It brought to mind the quip, uh, often mistakenly attributed to Mark Twain, that history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. It's not hard to foresee Congress making fundamental change once again in grazing policy on public lands. One option is to accelerate a trend that has already emerged in some parts of the West in recent years, to buy public lands grazing permits from willing sellers and permanently retiring the public lands from grazing. Now, a third challenge in the modern era is managing recreational use. 
Here's the headlines we've all seen. Rather than wrestling with proposals for logging or mining or other kinds of intensive development, modern public land managers are much more likely to be struggling to balance recreational use with the protection of wildlife and cultural resources and wrestling with whether and how to accommodate hikers, off-road vehicle users, mountain and e-bikers, bird watchers, wild horse lovers, target shooters, Instagram geotaggers, sport hunters and anglers, climbers, and myriad other enthusiasts. The recent surge in this use stress, stresses the infrastructure, personnel, and budgets of the managing agencies, as well as the lands themselves, threatening to love them to death. And there's another kind of recreational use. Growing numbers of people, recreational in quotes here, growing numbers of people on the margins of sky high price communities like Jackson Hole, who because of a lack of affordable housing are overstaying their camping permits on public lands. Now, in closing, let me go back to this illustration of how the arc of the nation's evolving public land policy has bent decisively toward conserving more and more lands for recreation, inspiration, science, and public education. And interestingly enough, as this chart shows, kept pace with US population growth. That's the dark, uh, dark thing across the bottom. While, as I mentioned, the Trump administration sought to reverse that trajectory, nearly all of its attempts to do so involved exercising executive authority, which means that its initiatives can be, and many are in the process of being undone by the Biden administration. Now, this is not to suggest the Trump administration has had little effect on public lands, to the contrary, its refusal to address these huge challenges I mentioned have put us further behind. And its relentless assault on science and on the stewardship capacity of federal land management agencies will not be easy to repair. An important ingredient for meeting all these challenges the public lands face is money. For without adequate funding, agencies will find it harder to fulfill their stewardship mission while keeping the lands accessible for public use. Over the long term, lack of money will inevitably undermine public support for public lands. Now, some good news is that the more than 600 million acres of public lands actually consume less than one quarter of 1% of the total US government expenditures. Not so good news is that agency funding has not kept pace with the growing challenges, but there are hopeful signs of change. Last year's Great American Outdoors Act established a sizable restoration fund to address agencies' infrastructure maintenance backlog. Congress has also made some progress in coming to grips with the skyrocketing costs of fi fighting wildfires involving public lands, fires that are made worse by a destabilizing climate, compounded by the growing proliferation of home building on private land in the so-called wildland urban interface. Now, in the end, public land policy will as before be determined through the political process and thus by how Americans react to changes now underway. On that, I only have questions, not answers. Will voters continue to support protecting public lands and biodiversity as a changing climate takes its toll? Will they support acquiring and protecting more public lands as the world grapples with ongoing destruction of natural landscapes and a grim decline in biodiversity? How will voters respond as more and more iconic places on public lands become crowded? How might public land policy change if rejecting rather than respecting the teachings of science becomes a dominant attitude? Or if partisan rhetoric intensifies and the American political system becomes more dysfunctional? Will candidates for public office, especially in places where public lands are abundant, continue to believe that keeping and protecting these lands in public ownership enhances the quality of life? How such questions are answered will determine whether the longstanding bipartisan consensus on the general direction of public land policy will endure or unravel. If it unravels, the future is even harder to see. If the public decides to divest, that the US should divest itself of large amounts of public lands, who might acquire them and for what purpose? Western states have traditionally resisted taking over management of most public lands, seeing it as a costly headache rather than an opportunity. On the other hand, very wealthy people have long been interested in acquiring large amounts of land for retreats and playthings, and speculators have long been interested in promoting second home developments and the like. 
But would their interest be dampened by the changing climate, especially factoring in wildfires? Could it be that the U.S. will continue to hold large amounts of land in public ownership, primarily because no other institution in our society wants to take responsibility for them? Although there are those who believe that politics never produces good results, my book calls America's public lands a political success story. In one sense, that's undeniably true. Most Americans today agree that holding and protecting large amounts of land and national ownership open to all has been extraordinarily visionary and beneficial. For all of its imperfections, in other words, our political system has bridged partisan, regional, and other divides to produce a result that most Americans today support. Indeed, one could fairly say that the public lands furnish some of the best examples of long-term thinking the American political system has ever produced. They are, as Richard Nixon put it in 1971, the nation's breathing space, a vast public asset that nurtures national pride, physical and mental health, and a spirit of community in an increasingly diverse nation, and that offers millions of people life-changing encounters <clears throat> with nature at modest cost. <clears throat> Moreover, public lands related tourism has become the economic anchor of many communities. Public land policy has also begun, admittedly tardily, to better reflect our society's diversity and to atone for past wrongs. President Biden's appointment of Deb Holland to be Interior Secretary, the first Native American to hold the cabinet post in US history, signals a rise in Native American influence over public land policy and reminds us that public lands can play a part in redressing some of the injustices of the past, opening another way to find common ground. In his seminal work, The Wealth of Nations, published the same year as the Declaration of Independence, the Scottish philosopher Adam Smith, the champion of free market capitalism, made a strong case for private ownership of land with one exception. A great and civilized nation, he wrote, ought to hold some lands for the purpose of pleasure and magnificence for everyone's benefit. That our national government responding to public opinion has heeded Smith's advice is worth celebrating, a welcome counter to the political polarization and distrust that currently plague us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Stop here. Thank you, John. Uh, lots of food for thought, and that's reflected in the uh, wide variety, the plethora of questions that we have. You mentioned uh, in your closing remarks, you mentioned Deb Holland. Uh, we have a question related to that, which I'd like to pose to you for starters. Uh, and that question is, is, you noted that a great deal of land was taken from North Americans, uh, excuse me, Native Americans in North America. Is there any pressure or interest in changing the status of public lands back to Indian lands? If not, should there be? And was Paula, Holland's uh, appointment, an indication that maybe the administration is looking in that direction. Um, well, it's a, you know, it's it's uh, obviously something that's uh, being talked about a fair amount. I, I would say, first of all, and I, I've taught Indian law and dealt with Indian issues over much of my career. Uh, I can tell you, it is one of the most complicated areas of law uh, and uh, and complicated histories. Um, that, that is very different from place to place. And it's very hard to generalize about uh, um, Indian wrongs and how they've been dealt with in the past. Um, uh, one chapter in my book actually talks at some length about a number and recounts a number of examples where uh, Indians have been given more influence over lands of, uh, of, uh, that are sacred to them or uh, culturally important to them. They have in some cases been given title to lands that were wrongfully taken from them. Um, and uh, so there, there's quite a bit of history here uh, and quite a few laws that actually enhance Native American influence over, over public lands. And I expect we'll certainly see more than that, more of that. Now, will there be any great movement to actually divest uh, large amounts of land to tribes? Um, I think it's it's very complicated, um, uh, and I, I don't think we'll see a broad movement to that 
effect. But I think there, there will be places where uh, tribes will regain influence and maybe control, and in some cases, maybe even title. Um, and there have been, and this is an ongoing process. I mean, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. President Richard Nixon actually restored an area to the Taos Pueblo uh, from a national force that had been shown to be wrongfully, have been wrongfully taken from them. They were never compensated for it. It was, it was a, basically stolen from them. Um, in the, the middle 1980s, uh, no, I'm sorry, 1970s, there was a big controversy in the Grand Canyon that pitted the environmental groups against the Native American tribes over whether the Havasupai Reservation in the Grand Canyon should be expanded. Uh, and interestingly enough, the environmental groups lost that battle and the Havasupai Reservation was expanded substantially uh, as a result. And that was kind of a turning point because I think that led the environmental groups, the conservation groups that advocate for public lands to better understand the Indian concerns. And so I think there's an ongoing process, certainly Holland's um, um, position as interior secretary puts her in a position of some influence over this. And so I, I think, think we'll definitely see broad activity on this point. One, one last point. I, I saw a proposal the other day that went along the lines of the national parks were all stolen from the Indians. And, and so we ought to give the national parks back to the Indians. As I mentioned in my talk, that's not the sequence. The sequence was the lands were basically taken from the Indians. Um, years and years in most cases before decisions were made, let's keep these lands and let's put them in protected areas. So it wasn't, the, the park service wasn't the bad guy in this, in this, uh, in this story. And, and that's important to keep in mind, I think. Great. Uh, I have a question here that's come up in, in a couple of different ways and it uh, speaks to the uh, seemingly opposing missions of recreation and conservation uh, within interior and the evidence of, uh, of those conflicts we see in Yosemite, we see it in Yellowstone and, and elsewhere uh, where places are being loved to death. And uh, can you comment uh, on that? And also what has been, if any, the influence of the pandemic and the shift in the demographics out of the cities? Well, it, it is in some respects, if you talk to most public land managers, they'll tell you that is the thing they are grappling with the most, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, just, to, I mean, if you look at the statistics on park visitation after a, a lull in the pandemic, they are now shooting up uh, higher than ever before. Um, it's very complicated. I mean, the loving to death problem is a, is a real problem. Um, now, we have a lot of public lands and one of the strategies that's being pursued is let's steer people away from, you know, some of the really iconic national parks that are glutted with people and send them to other areas that are, you know, very beautiful and you can have great encounters with nature and, and recreation and all of that. So I think we're seeing more of that uh, and we'll see more of that. Um, but in the end, uh, you know, it's, th there is a collision between conservation and recreation, at least intensive, what, uh, Edward Abbey used to call industrial tourism or industrial recreation in these heavily used areas. There is a tension. And uh, happily, uh, you know, the Park Service is, has actually wrestled with this in the big iconic parks for, for decades. So we have some from experience in dealing with this, but the quantity, the, the quantum leap in outdoor activities is, is really uh, uh, a big modern problem. You spoke about the changing face of the public lands insofar as how they're, how they're being used. So I, I'd like to uh, maybe take you back to something you, you mentioned and ask the following question. Uh, is there any future for what might be called traditional industrial uses of public lands? Uh, you spoke to the, the lack of interest in, in, uh, in leases in the uh, Arctic uh, Reserve. Uh, do you see a change in how we use our public lands for oil and gas exploitation, logging, uh, and so forth? And in what, in what way, for example, is the global supply change perhaps also changing how we use the lands? Maybe the, the way in which we, we get our timber has changed, et cetera. Well, the, the trends I outlined in my talk are, are, are pronounced, and I think I hate to say inevitable, but uh, you know it, it's hard to imagine a future for fossil fuel uh, 
uh, extraction on public lands, um, looking out very far because of these global forces that are operating. Um, uh, timber, uh, you know, largely after the kind of peak in the 70s and 1980s, uh, largely moved to private, more plantation type lands, particularly in the Southeast, private lands. Uh, and that relieved a lot of the pressure from uh, public lands. Um, and uh, that could change, but, you know, timber is a global market, but there are a lot of substitutes for timber and all kinds of construction. And uh, so I, I'm not sure that's going to change. Um, uh, hard rock mining, as I mentioned, is, is kind of an interesting example because of this problem with certain kinds of minerals that may have great value for, for the green energy revolution, you know, cobalt and copper and the like. Um, and so definitely there's a lot of attention being paid to that. Um, and the, the, the problem is the law that, that uh, authorizes extraction of those minerals also authorizes extraction of a lot of stuff that we don't need. And so uh, really Congress needs, I think, to step in and, and address this problem uh, with a, um, a, a specific solution and not just let the current law, which almost everybody says is, is inadequate, um, operate. Um, so I, I think the trends I described, uh, uh, it's hard to imagine them um, changing, but you never know. I mean, if carbon capture actually developed as a technology, then that could bring fossil fuels back or to some, to some extent. Um, and so, uh, but frankly, here's an example uh, I like to use when you talk about fossil fuels. The, the oil industry is operating on Alaska's North Slope now, uh, west of the Arctic Refuge. Um, uh, they are now using chillers to freeze the permafrost because they can only really operate uh, with heavy equipment in, this, in the wintertime because they operate on ice roads, because it's much too damaging to operate that equipment on thawed ground. Well, the winters have contracted by weeks up there on the North Slope. So the companies are now artificially freezing the permafrost so they can operate. Uh, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline has, the same, has some serious problems because of the melting permafrost. Um, that's gonna add a lot of cost to shipping oil through that pipeline to shore up uh, the foundations of the pipeline. So you're seeing costs like that, that nobody ever anticipated 10 or 20 years ago uh, with fossil fuel extraction in some of these remote places, which, which does not give me hope that the trends are gonna change actually. Uh, on a, perhaps a, a local uh, level, there's a question that's come up from several of our viewers. And that is the, uh, the, the, the movement of the headquarters for BLM from Washington to Grand Junction, um, which came about in the previous administration. And from my reading, uh, that may have happened largely in name only. But could you comment uh, from your perspective, was that a, a positive move? Is it a good move for the West? Or is it actually detrimental to the West's interest because of the lack of Washington uh, influence? Yeah, I, th I think my, my own take on this personally, and I having worked in the Department of the Interior for a dozen years and dealt with the BLM a lot, um, I, this was a political move. I mean, it was uh, political in, in a small p sense. It was to uh, you know, make people in Western Colorado happy, I suppose. Uh, bring some jobs there and that sort of thing. I mean, the, the Democrats and the congressional delegation supported it as well as the Republicans. So that's why I say it was small p political. Um, I think as somebody who's been involved in a bunch of decisions in the Interior Department, not having a BLM headquarters in Washington, in the Interior Department building, it probably costs the BLM some influence. I mean, I think that's, a, you know, there, there's a lot of things the Interior Department does that involves agencies different agencies bumping up against each other. Um, and if the BLM is sort of not at the table because its director and its headquarters is out West, when all the other agencies are in Washington, um, that sort of lack of presence, I think is a problem. So I think you can make an argument that that was not a good move for, for BLM influence and, and therefore really Western influence on how decisions get made. Um, but you know, because it was a small P political decision, it'll be a small P political decision that the secretary will have to make, I think, uh, uh, whether to move it back or how and under what circumstances. Uh, 
again, uh, maybe a uh, large influence to uh, to Colorado's Coloradans is the plan to reintroduce the the wolf into uh, Colorado, and this is has just begun. Uh, you've probably uh, in the '90s uh, dealt with this when there was a similar program in Wyoming and Montana and Yellowstone. Uh, what is your view on how and if this can be done in a way that's equitable to all parties? Well, to some extent, it's already happening. Uh, I think, you know, cat is out of the bag is probably not the right expression to use here. But, uh, uh, you know, um, wolves are returning to California, for example, Northern California, coming down from Oregon and Washington, British Columbia. Um, uh, I think I think wolves will, re, uh, barring some major change in policy, will re, recapture a lot of ground. Basically, uh, you know, the big opposition is primarily livestock operations uh, who uh, object because of the predation uh, of wolves on livestock. Um, and in fact, for a hundred years, the government has operated a predator control program, spending millions of dollars a year to to uh, exterminate the wolves to begin with, and and spend it now exterminating coyotes and other things. Um, if you look at the numbers, actually, and I have looked at numbers in terms of uh, livestock predation, um, wolves are a very, very tiny fraction of the loss of livestock. Uh, it's become a big symbolic issue for lots of reasons, but I think in terms of on the ground impacts, a uh, wolf reintroduction or wolf uh, uh, the uh, proliferation of wolves uh, is not going to have a, a huge impact on livestock uh, uh, operations, but but it clearly has a hugely powerful um, uh, cultural um, uh, impact and, and will be fought out on those grounds. A different topic. Uh, one of our viewers has asked the question, would you speak to the future of the Antiquities Act? <laughs> and the powers of the executive branch to protect landscapes, considering the significant beating that the two national monuments that you spoke to uh, have taken or could have taken. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I, the Antiquities Act, in my view, is one of the world's great, one of the, the country's great laws. It has been used by almost every president, uh, re many Republicans as well as Democrats, uh, to protect uh, more than 100 million acres of land as initial protection. Typically what happens is a president like Hoover will uh, uh, use the Antiquities Act to protect a, a, an area of land, call it a national monument, and then Congress will, a few years later, make it a national park. That, that's happened over and over again. Um, and so it's been enormously influential. Now, what President Trump did in down, significantly downsizing these two Utah monuments was unprecedented as to scale. No previous president had done anything that big. There had been some nibbling uh, and boundary adjustments and that sort of thing. Uh, but the, the question that was being litigated was, does the president have the power to downsize a monument? Does the Antiquities Act give the president the power to reduce as well as uh, create or enlarge monuments? That's never been decided. Um, and so that was a question that was being teed up for the courts. Now, that question is probably not going to be litigated because if President Biden reinstates the monument, then the, the question becomes moot and we, we won't have an answer for that. But the track record of the Antiquities Act is clear uh, that it has been used um, by many presidents uh, uh, of both parties to, to protect lots and lots of land. And I think, uh, and there does, there's not really an appetite in Congress to, uh, uh, to do away with it. And in fact, it has moved offshore. This has been the, the modern, since the turn of the 21st century, President Bush and then Obama used the Antiquities Act to set aside large marine areas, um, tens of millions of acres in the Pacific and, uh, and several million acres in the Atlantic. So that's a whole new Antiquities Act development. Um, and uh, so I, I think the Antiquities Act has a, a bright future, frankly, and I don't, I don't see Congress really meddling with it. Um, There's a, a question uh, concerning international relations, particularly with our uh, neighboring uh, border countries. Uh, how well do we work with Canada and Mexico? Uh, 
uh, to protect public lands uh, and the influence that one nation has on the other and vice versa? It's a really interesting question. If you look at Canada, what we did in the American West, Canada did pretty much the same thing around the same time. Uh, that is, we started establishing national parks in the 1870s, Yellowstone, etc. Canada started setting aside national parks in British Columbia uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, uh, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And then we have, a, we have one international park, the Glacier Waterton Park, which is a park that extends across the international boundary. Um, interestingly, when, when Big Bend Park was created in Texas, one of the reasons that the Texans and F. Franklin Roosevelt wanted to create it was to establish an international park there, much as Waterton Glacier. Uh, the areas to the south in Mexico are somewhat protected, but we've not quite established an international park at Big Bend like we did at Waterton Glacier. But I think it's fair to say, now, the other thing I should say about the Mexican border is it is now obviously engulfed in border politics, uh, uh, you know, in terms of immigration and that sort of thing. And uh, there are, I, I've actually been to the Mexican border in Arizona at a wildlife refuge a couple of years ago. Um, and the border wall going through a, a, a wildlife refuge where there's protected lands on both sides is a problem for the wildlife, I can tell you that. So uh, uh, that's, a, that's kind of a hot button issue in New Mexico and Arizona in particular in California. Um, but uh, so I, I think the immigration issue has very much colored the sort of international conservation issues for public lands along the southern border. In Canada, uh, along the Canadian border, though, the, there's, there's a lot of cooperation and uh, cross-border uh, uh, cooperative protection. So uh, within the Interior Department, you have the four services or agencies that you mentioned. You also have what used to be called the Minerals Management Service, which has been subdivided into two uh, bureaus, uh, essentially performing the functions that were previously performed. So within Interior, how uh, well are, are, are plans and strategies, particularly related to uh, carbon usage and sweet sequestration and, and alternative renewable energies, et cetera, how well are they uh, coordinated between the offshore interests of what used to be MMS and the uh, onshore interests uh, that fall within the public lands? Um, that is an ongoing interesting issue. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned before, the Interior Department is, uh, has a lot of cross-cutting issues that kind of conflict with each other and a lot of agencies within it that bump up against each other all the time. The kind of unofficial history of the Interior Department is called the Department of Everything Else, which meant that historically, you know, if you didn't know what to do with a government agency, you put it in the Interior Department and kind of hope for the best. Um, the, um, there's a good deal of coordination. I think that the, both the biodiversity and the climate uh, challenges are going to force more and more such cooperation. Um, <clears throat> the um, um, uh, Agencies still have different missions, and so they're not necessarily always going to be on the same page, but um, that's what the Secretary of the Interior is there for. And the office I headed, which, which was the legal office, was uh, deliberately a self-contained office so that all the lawyers for the agencies worked in the solicitor's office. They did not work inside those agencies. And that made the solicitor's office and the lawyer's office a kind of centrifugal force. Um, uh, to, to bind things together. We used to negotiate a lot of interagency disputes in our office because um, uh, that's where the sort of rubber met the road. And, uh, uh, and an effective Secretary of the Interior can do a lot to force agencies to all get on the same page. You know, the Endangered Species Act is another example where the Fish and Wildlife Service administers the Endangered Species Act, but obviously the BLM and the Park Service and, and other agencies have to uh, you know, pay attention to endangered species. So there's a lot of room for interagency conflict. We have a couple of questions. One is a political question, but this is a, a policy forum, public policy forum. So the question is, is the current um, 
conservative Supreme Court uh, movement a potential threat to public lands? Uh, it's a good question. Um, um, traditionally, historically, I can tell you, having written this book, the courts have generally been very uh, deferential to Congress and the, the executive on public lands issues. There, there's almost no example of a, the courts weighing in that kind of have upset the direction of public land policy. More, more, more commonly, they've been very supportive. I mean, for example, the Antiquities Act. Uh, presidents have used that act 150 times. It's been litigated many times. There, the courts have never questioned presidential authority. Um, now, the Antiquities Act is an interesting example because in, uh, I think it was March of this year, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts um, filed a, a memorandum, a, a kind of a separate opinion in a case involving challenging President Obama's use of the Antiquities Act to create a national monument off of the coast of Maine and Massachusetts. And the court decided not to hear the case. Uh, and John Roberts filed a, a separate memorandum from that decision in which he didn't dissent, but he basically said something like, I'm paraphrasing here, gee, the Antiquities Act is interesting. I mean, it raises some interesting questions about whether the president has all this broad power to do this or not. And, and it would be pretty interesting if the court wanted to take a look at this. And that was seen as kind of a, a, a shot across the bows, I think. Uh, wow, is the court signaling here or is Robert signaling that uh, the court might get involved in these issues in a big way? Um, now, he only wrote for himself. No other justice joined him, but it sort of raised that exact issue. What are the courts going to do um, with all this stuff going on? Uh, my own view, again, based on history, is the courts will, uh, you know, obviously they can and will decide questions of statutory interpretation and, and that sort of thing to make sure that the executive is properly carrying out what Congress authorized it to do. But will they jump in in a big way and kind of upset the apple cart. To do that, they would have to ignore dozens of past decisions stretching back over 150 years where they have basically deferred to the executive and to Congress. And so I, I really, it, it would be astonishing to me, frankly, if they, if they made a major change in that attitude. It's possible we have a different court now than we had, say, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, but I, I, I will be very surprised if that happens. Uh, <clears throat> Today, the UN's uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a, a report, and one of their leading uh, statements was that anthropogenic climate change is unequivocal. I want to go back to uh, public lands, 30% of which are forested lands. Uh, they are a great source of sequestering carbon. Uh, forests do so at about uh, uh, one metric ton per acre per year. That's the good news. The bad news is when they burn, all that carbon goes back into the, into the atmosphere. And forest fires release about 25 metric tons per acre during, during the fires. And in California in 2018, there were more carbon emissions coming from wildfires than from all of the automobiles in California. So with that as, as a backdrop, is Interior well engaged in how to manage public lands in a way that uh, strengthens sequestration and perhaps minimizes wildfires? And uh, are they doing so actively and, and how are they doing? Well, it's, uh, it, is, it is one of those big questions that lots of people are devoting time and energy and thought to what to do. Um, you're exactly right. I, I saw some statistics the other, way, uh, the other day. Uh, carbon emissions nationwide went down significantly during the pandemic because people were driving and flying less. But almost all of that reduction was more than made up for by carbon emissions from wildfires. So... Uh, 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 that, that, is, that is a problem. It's a horrendously complicated problem, frankly. Um, and I think the more scientists look at this, the more complicated it gets. For example, um, I mentioned that we now know from tree ring studies that, that uh, 
the 20th century was actually one of the wettest, maybe the wettest century in the last 2000 years. Uh, it meant a lot of growth, a lot of stuff grew. At the same time, we were suppressing most fires, uh, which meant it grew even more. Um, um, and you know, before we now know, Native Americans use fire as a, as a tool, a uh, landscape management tool. That stopped, obviously, when the Native Americans were dispossessed. Um, uh, so we need to obviously address this problem. Now we have a drought, trees are drying, you're gonna have more insect loss, uh, uh, which is gonna to add to the wildfire problem. So what do you do? Well, it's not easy because um, you can say, well, we should have more thinning. Uh, we should get rid of the brush and get rid of the smaller trees and make forests less likely to burn. Uh, we can do that, that takes money. Um, it's very intensive, you know, labor intensive. Um, uh, we fight these fires, not to protect the lands, we fight the fires to protect the structures that people build near them. Uh, people are building more and more structures nearer and nearer to public lands. I mean, it's this, this so-called wildland urban interface. There've been an absolute explosion of, you know, mountain cabins and subdivisions and that sort of thing. For good reason, people like to, you know, go there and stay. But Every one of those structures creates a problem. Now, watching this in California, the insurance industry is obviously beginning to weigh in here and try to figure out how do we, how do we deal with this problem through insurance policies. Um, building these cabins is basically controlled by local land use law. It's not controlled by federal law uh, because this is on private land, generally speaking, and that, that is a local land use function. So you have the federal government sort of fighting the fires to protect the, the homes and the, the people are building under local laws. That creates a, a tension right there. Um, and uh, so adding it all up, um, I don't think there's an easy solution. Uh, we're, we're probably going to spend more money thinning uh, where we can, uh, but again, labor intensive and all of that. And the worst fires thinning doesn't help with. Um, so a tremendously complicated problem, uh, expensive, no easy answers, no quick fix, no single fix, frankly. John, this has been a great uh, conversational evening. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up with one final question, which uh, I think many of us probably have on our minds. It comes from one of our uh, viewers tonight. If you had a magic wand, <laughs> What one thing would you do to change in regard public land in the U.S.? Uh, would I change regarding public land policy? Uh, broadly speaking, public lands in the U.S. Oh, policy my gosh. Policy or implementation. Um, <laughs> I would, uh, and this is kind of self-serving, but I would say people need to understand the history more, how we got here, uh, because I think then it will be easier to work together to find solutions because these problems like the wildfire problem, tremendously complicated require, is going to require a lot of political skill to solve. And uh, uh, the public lands on the whole, as I said, are, uh, are a success story in political problems being addressed successfully. So I would hope they would be a kind of a beacon for, uh, for us doing this again. So I think that's what we need. We need more attention, more understanding, more science, uh, and more goodwill, basically, to, to address these huge problems that the public lands face, as well as the rest of society, obviously. John, thank you so much. And again, a reminder that uh, your book comes out in January, January 18th, uh, Our Common Ground, A History of America's Public Lands. Thank you so much, and thank you to all who've been able to watch tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Should I stop?